Hello and welcome to Japan Society's webinar tonight. My name is Ramona Handel Baima. I am Chief Program Officer at Japan Society. Welcome to Zen and Jap Japanese spiritual practices. Um, if you will allow me to just give a few notes of appreciation before we get started, I'd like to dearly thank our co presenter for this Living Tradition series webinar, webinar series Portland Japanese Garden. Um, and this is brought to you with additional support for the series provided by the government of Japan. Um, and the Talks Plus program season at Japan Society is um, brought to you by Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group and Oryx Corporation USA, as well as a few anonymous donors, the Sandy Heck Lecture Fund and Helen and Kenneth A. Collins. So thank you all for making this possible tonight. This is the second installment of our Living Traditions series. It's a five-part series. Um, we started with a look at Japanese gardens, which you can see online if you missed it. Um, this series um, unravels the historical journeys of some of the most iconic facets of Japanese culture through conversations between thought-provoking experts and cultural stewards on how they maintain deep-rooted traditions in the present day. Tonight's talk, this talk examines Zen's role and perception in Japan and the West, differences in practices and the path forward in a post or kind of post COVID world. Our moderator tonight is uh, Professor Paul S. Atkins. He's a professor of Japanese in the Department of Asian Languages and Literature at the University of Washington, Seattle. Thank you, Professor Atkins for moderating tonight. He holds not only a PhD in Japanese from Stanford University, but he specializes in literature, drama, and culture of medieval Japan. Um, his publications, which I'm sure you'll all want to check out after tonight, include Take Off, The Life and Works of a Medieval Japanese Poet, and Revealed Identity, The No Plays of Komporu Zenchikun. So over to you, Paul. Thanks for taking us on our journey tonight. Thank you very much, Ramona, for the kind introduction, and thank you to everyone for joining us for tonight's program, or this morning's program, Zen and Japanese Spiritual Practices. In this program, we're going to hear presentations from three distinguished speakers, and those presentations, which are going to be quite brief, will be followed by discussion among the panelists, and we will leave time to take questions from you, the audience, at the end. And so I invite you to submit your questions through the YouTube chat throughout the program. You don't have to wait until the Q&A. As soon as you have a question, you can just type it in there. And if we have time, we'll get to that. Uh, we titled this uh, program Zen and Japanese Spiritual Practices. Zen is definitely a Japanese spiritual practice. It's most certainly also a religion. It does claim that there are supernatural beings that exert influence on our world, and it asserts the existence of an afterlife or afterlives. But it's also much more than a religion. It contains, for example, a method of meditation. In fact, strictly speaking, Zen is meditation. Dhyana, the Sanskrit word that became Chan, Son, Zen, just means meditation. And Zen has produced a rich and intriguing culture. And it offers us both a theory of mind and a way of life. In my opinion, in my limited knowledge, no other Asian religion has exerted such a strong grip on the American consciousness. From the 1950s onward, many Americans discovered Zen, uh, as I did, I think, via the literary works of the Beat Generation, which sought alternatives to the materialism, superficiality, artificiality, and conformity of mainstream American culture. In their place, Zen offers spirituality, profundity, spontaneity, and iconoclasm, or so it seems at least from the outside looking in. Our first speaker tonight is the consummate insider when it comes to the world of Zen, the Reverend Daiko Matsuyama, deputy head priest of Taizo-in Zen Buddhist Temple in Kyoto as well as a visiting lecturer at Stanford University. He holds a master's degree in agriculture and life sciences from the University of Tokyo. 
After training at Heidinji Temple in Niza in Saitama Prefecture, he was appointed the deputy head priest of Taizoin Temple, which is part of the Myoshinji complex in 2007. Reverend Matsuyama is acclaimed for organizing intercultural activities for foreign visitors, and he is the author of a number of books, including my favorite title, Forget What's Important First, 30 Zen Teachings for the Wavering Soul. And now I'd like to turn it over to Reverend Matsuyama to get us started. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Kyoto. So uh, I have very short time, so I'd like to start from uh, the introduction of the temple. So can you show the video, please? So uh, it was uh, the introduction movie of the temple. So this is a map of our complex. So we're the Myoshinji uh, temple complex. We're the headquarters of Myoshinji school of Rinza Zen sectors. And uh, we have around 3,400 branch temple all over Japan and some located in United States. And this is the headquarters. And we consist of 46 small temples in the complex. And one of the uh, sub temple is Taizoin. So uh, we were founded in 1404 by the third head priest of the complex. And uh, we are, of course, uh, the, uh, the Zen sectors. So Zen was, uh, as Buddhism itself was created in, in India around 2,500 years ago by Buddha. And after 500, 500 years, so Zen was also created in India. And around 1,500 years ago, it was introduced to China. Uh, by Bodhidharma, so in Japanese he is called as Daruma-san, and in Ton and Son dynasty it was flourished in China, and uh, a thousand years ago uh, Zen was introduced uh, to Japan from China. And uh, uh, born in India, raised in China, and introduced to Japan, but I'm afraid there is no more original style of Zen, nor in India, nor in China. So Zen has survived uh, surrounding countries around China, like uh, Vietnam, uh, some part of Korea, and Japan. And now uh, it's again spreading to the world. And next slide, please. So Zen has around 2,000 years history. Uh, so it is very hard to explain you uh, in simple words or phrases, but I'd like to introduce you to characteristics of Zen today. So this is the Chinese character of Zen. So uh, this uh, character express the teachings of Zen the most. So we can separate into two parts of this character. So left part, so this is a verb and the meaning is to show something. And the right part, this is a noun and the meaning is, to, uh, meaning is simplicity. So to, to show the simplicity. So this is the, uh, the first characteristics of Zen. So if you come to Zen temple in, in Japan, so you will find the structure is brown, simple, minimal design structure. And the Zen gardens, so rock, sand, moss, so that's all, very simple. And we practice meditation to make our mind simple. So we are living in a very busy and uh, complicated world. So to be simple is very important key to live a good life. And the second characteristic is that we highly cherish practice and experiences. Next slide, please. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, the picture of myself 15 years ago when I was a trainee in the monastery. 
So uh, actually, I was uh, I studied in a Catholic school for six years when I was a junior high school and a high school. So I had six years Christian education. So uh, if I set myself in the Christian atmosphere, I could feel more Buddhist by comparing the teachings. So, uh, so Zen is a highly cherished practice and experiences, learning from practice and experiences. For example, so I am drinking the roasted tea, and uh, I explain you how tasty it is. A little bit uh, cold and smells good, tasty. But however I describe it in words as a phrases, you will never know how tasty it is unless you drink it. So this is basic idea of Zen. So there are hundreds of thousands of books about Zen or the mindfulness in the world, or there are many masters who got enlightenment. But how many masters do you listen to? Or how many books are read? I will never know how great the enlightenment is. So that's why we do the same things as Buddha did. And we try to find what it is like for ourselves through practices, experiences. So this is uh, the other characteristics of Zen. And next slide, please. And now Zen or the mindfulness is very popular in the US. And, but I think uh, there are some differences uh, Zen in US and Zen in Japan, like the uh, difference of sushi, right? I don't want to say which is good, which is bad, but it's different. But the biggest difference is that uh, in US, uh, they accept Zen and the mindfulness in a very utilitarian ways. They practice Zen mindfulness to gain something, better performances, a good job, big money, but we do not practice Zen in that way. So the goal of the Zen uh, is to clarify the self. So what is a self? So this is, uh, I think, uh, the, the biggest difference. But uh, I would like to explain you in detail later in the discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Matsuyama. Next up, uh, we're going to hear from Shoko Mekata, who is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of South Asian Studies at Harvard University. Dr. Mekata obtained her MA from Otani University in Kyoto in 2005. From 2007 to 2008, she studied the Tibetan language at Tibet University in Lhasa. In 2011, she received her PhD from Otani University with a dissertation focused on the early history and especially genealogy of the Sakya school of Tibetan Buddhism. Please go ahead, Dr. Mekata. Thank you very much. Hello. Um... Thank you for introducing me, Professor Atkins. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about Zen in America or the West, and also the difference between Zen and then Zen in Japan. And then I, I believe this is actually not only about Zen, but it's about Buddhism itself. Um, could we show? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. And then Next one, please. Yes. So there are three topics I want to talk about today. Uh, how does Western society regard them? How has Zen affected Western society? And what are the differences between the Zen practices in Japan and that in the West? Next one, please. So the most well-known figure in the general when we talk about Japanese Buddhism or Zen in America is Suzuki Daisetsu. Next one, please. Um, what did this Suzuki? He introduced Japanese Buddhism in English in the Western world. And as for the background about how Buddhism spread in the West, one big factor is declining attendance in Christian churches in Europe, or maybe in America also. In that kind of environment, people still wanted some, some kind of spirituality. Then some people were attracted to a new, new religion. People thought Buddhism is easy to practice by oneself. People thought. And since they don't need to accept many doctrines such as the like, heaven or hell, things like that. And also the thinking of mindfulness is good for them psychologically. Um, next slide, please. So this is a well-known Zen symbol, Enso. 
which is interpreted in many ways, such as enlightenment, dharma, or the universe, etc. This group of interpretation expresses the mind without attachment, which is one of the fundamental Buddhist thought. In the West, Buddhism is recognized as a symbol of inner peace. Next one, please. So how has then affected Western society? Uh, next slide, please. So we could say that Zen has affected Western society in many positive ways because Westerners are attracted in the way above when I just mentioned. Zen along with other Asian religions has contributed to the a more like, pluralistic out outlook in the West. Um, next slide, please. So what are the differences between the Zen practices in Japan and that in the West? So I moved to America some years ago from Japan and I have seen many American or Western Buddhists. From my ex experience, I found some very interesting things. One of them is that in American Buddhist, um, Buddhism, some people who claim that like, they are Buddhist, but they don't believe or they don't like some fundamental things in the traditional Buddhist doctrine, such as karma or reincarnation. If they don't believe those teachings, those thinking, they cannot be Buddhist in the traditional Eastern way. However, it seems that's being accepted in America or Western society. So first I saw that was kind of awkward. However, as I talked with them, I gradually started thinking that that's deeply related to the American or Western history and religion, especially Christianity. So then or Buddhism in the West is not the same as in Japan. Naturally, it has changed. So Buddhism has grown in the same, some like unique ways in the West. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those stimulating remarks. And I'm sure we'll uh, want to be pursuing them a little bit later. Uh, our third speaker is Mr. Dave Morin, who's an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist. He is co-founder and managing director of Offline Ventures, a venture capital fund. Mr. Morin holds a degree in economics from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and he is chairman of the board of trustees of Isolin Institute, a nonprofit holistic learning and retreat center. And now I'd like to turn it over at last to Mr. Maureen. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's nice to be here, everyone. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in uh, this conversation on a topic very near and dear to my heart. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, um, I serve as the chairman of the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. So I come to you from uh, the sunny coast of California, which was founded um, out of the East-West uh, Studies Program by uh, two founders um, at Stanford who had discovered Zen and yoga lineages um, early in the 1950s. And out of love of those started hosting um, students on campus to do the, pr do the practices that they discovered in Eastern thinking. And um, at the time in the 50s, these, th these thinkings were not that welcome um, in the United States and in fact, deeply stigmatized. And so um, these uh, founders ultimately ended up dropping out of Stanford. And one of them went to a uh, ashram in India to try to deepen his understanding of Buddhism. Um, and um, I think this story is a uh, preeminent and important story um, in regards to the questions that we're talking about today. In particular, how does Western society regard Zen? Um, in just over 50 years, uh, it's gone from being something deeply stigmatized that if you were talking about it on a college campus, um, you might be uh, stigmatized, asked to leave, asked to stop practicing witchcraft. Um, to today, over 50% of um, Americans now identify as spiritual but not religious. And so, uh, American society has deeply shifted over the last 50 years, and 
uh, as uh, some of my fellow speakers have talked about, Buddhism and in particular Zen have had a very big part in um, driving this change. Americans um, in particular on the Western side are still searching, um, looking for purpose, looking for meaning, looking for practices that they might be able to um, add to their busy lives. Um, even though some might misunderstand or misassociate Zen in particular with Taoism or other forms of Eastern practices, I think the idea of Zen represents a calm in a society that um, is otherwise largely in chaos <laughs> due to the way that we are organized. Um, and because of that, I think Zen has affected Western society in uh, a couple of very distinct ways. One, as I mentioned, um, as a spiritual practice, um, the thinking, uh, the way of thinking, or the way of unthinking, as um, some might say, uh, helps, I think, Americans um, in the way that uh, we tend to live a very stressful, very stressed out life. And so the practices and riddles and um, uh, uh, ways of thinking in Zen tend to, I think, help the American mind um, on the Western side uh, to unwind and to um, go in the other direction when most of us spend all of our days working. Um, it's also affected the American way of life as a design aesthetic. And I think if you were to actually ask most Americans, what is Zen? Uh, they might actually um, think of it purely as a design aesthetic, something that Apple delivers to you by way of a product or a way of designing your home or your garden. Um, and if you are very sophisticated, perhaps a way of thinking. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of the differences between the ways that Zen is practiced here and uh, that in Japan? Um, as somebody who helps run, uh, you know, Esalen is a school. We bring through about 15,000 students every year. Uh, we offer Zen, Tao, yoga, all forms of Eastern um, spiritual practice. We also study the theory um, in partnership with many research partners around the world. And the predominant difference, I would say, is that one is one of um, the individual versus the collective. Um, I think that most in the West consider it to be something that you practice as an individual, not necessarily in collective, uh, which is probably a misunderstanding. And the adherence is not as strict. Um, and uh, that's something that we can also talk about as well. But um, those are my opening thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your stimulating remarks, and thank you for uh, keeping to the agreed time. I'd like to open things up with a panel discussion, beginning just among the four of us before we um, open things even further to the questions and answers. I've got some questions for you, but I also encourage crosstalk if you've got questions for one another. That will be wonderful. We'll try to spread things around so everybody has a chance to say a few words. If I may, I'd like to begin with uh, Reverend Matsuyama um, and your emphasis on um, Zen's emphasis on direct experience. And you mentioned uh, the 100,000 books that are on Zen. I probably have you know, a couple of them back here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very interested um, uh, in Zen from that perspective. Zen seems to reject um, theoretical knowledge, to reject, um, you know, to prefer the empirical and it really has an anti-intellectual streak in it, which is interesting because it attracts the interests of intellectuals very much in the West. It's almost like they have a masochistic uh, desire to practice a religion that rejects their very way of life. So um, since I'm in a university, uh, I thought I would, I'm supposed to be an intellectual. I th I'd like to ask you about that. Is Zen really anti-intellectual or something else? And then the relationship between what Zen calls mind and you know the intellect and the brain. So, mm -hmm. if you would please. Yeah, thank you very much. So, of course, Zen do not reject intellectualism, but uh, uh, we have uh, how can I say uh, plenty of books, mainly a old story of the 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 conversation between the master and the disciples, and it is very very important. But um, as I said, uh, 
um, if I study books and the stories of uh, old masters, so there still lies big questions like uh, meaning of life. So what is a self? So what is enlightenment? So this is uh, uh, the things that cannot be solved by reading books. So, so that's why uh, so, um, we highly cherish uh, the learning from practices. So it is so in Zen teachings, there's a phrase that uh, uh, we cannot express in words as phrases, the, which is uh, most important and the core teachings. So I think this is uh, uh, the universal things uh, from ancient times. So that's why So it is a modern uh, technology world, but we still uh, cherish learning from practices. And it is very personal learning from practices, not uh, expressed in the books or the uh, words. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think everybody is uh, craving direct experience these days, especially since so much of our life is now mediated by these online encounters. Mm -hmm. And we really want, uh, you know, to eliminate, cut out the middle man or middle woman, middle person, and, and have this kind of direct experience. We're really craving that. Thank you very much. Thank I'd you. like to, if I may, shift to uh, Dr. Mekata. You said something interesting. Um, that I'd ask, like to ask you to pick up on and that, that with the, the understanding of Zen in the West, especially uh, the United States was shaped in its relationship to Christianity and uh, with the uh, implication that things would be different if it went to uh, a, a country that was, uh, uh, had a different religion or some, some way. Could you perhaps amplify a little bit about how um, what happens when Zen enters a Christian environment and how that uh, shapes their understanding of Zen compared to uh, other, perhaps uh, people who subscribe to other religions or no religion at all. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, you know, this is like, I think everybody is same. Um, for example, like with Japanese, most of like Japanese people are not religious, I believe. And then, but they actually believe like, like reincarnation, karma, things like that. And then I believe that is coming from the our like historical background, religious background, which is like Buddhism and Shinto. So in the same way, um, like many Westerners have the, the Christianity background, even they are not Christian, even they are not Christians, but in the deep like, mind, they have the background. And then um, recently I had an um, interesting conversation with one of my students who is um, Buddhist, the, the Western Buddhist. And then I asked him, like, for me, um, some people are saying, actually the, um, the students too, he really doesn't like thinking of karma, but he's saying he's Buddhist. And then um, he is, and also he is saying, um, like in the East, you, you people really, um, think that rituals are important. But we think, or at least he thinks, um, the face in, in like the deep in my mind is the important. So if I think I'm Buddhist, then I am Buddhist. I think uh, that's very typical thinking. And then I believe that is deeply related with Christianity thinking because in at least in Japan, I believe um, the most places in the East. If people say so, I don't believe karma, then we could say, oh no, you're not Buddhist. But that really doesn't work here, I think, because the person is saying he's Buddhist. Then nobody cannot deny that because we cannot you know, know the person's inside. I think that's the most interesting thing for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, people really pick and choose uh, a la carte with their religions and there's different practices. And it's not just Japan. Japan is famous for, you know, people being uh, Shinto when they need to and being Buddhist when they need to and Christian weddings and what have you. But I think that's uh, something that happens a lot if, if uh, 
you took a Catholic aside and asked them a series of yes, no questions, people would wind up, they'd be heretical, I think, pretty quickly. Uh, it's easy to get tripped up. Uh, thank you. I hope we can pursue that further. I'd like to just uh, make things fair and spread things around. Mr. Morin, um, you had a lot of intriguing things. Uh, your back, the backstory of Esalen, I wasn't aware, with, uh, aware of uh, as a Stanford person myself. Um, but I was also interested in what you said. Uh, a lot of people are spiritual, but not religious. And I was wondering if you could unpack that for us a little bit. Um, and uh, maybe we could begin there. What does that mean? Yeah, I, I think it actually comes on the heels of some of the conversation that um, you were just having that I really like this notion that um, in America, when people decide they're Buddhist, they're Buddhist. Um, you know, I think there's something to uh, the, 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 the Protestant um, ethic, which largely built the United States, was built on this notion of individualism. And in particular, uh, when the Protestant um, doctrine was written, a lot of focus was put on this uh, solo scriptura, this idea that by reading the Bible yourself as an individual, um, that is what brings you closer to God. And so a lot of the way that Americans tend to even talk about themselves is by saying, I am a Buddhist, or I am a Christian, or I, you know, I, I put on this identity. Um, and it's rarely in relation to another, which really um, in the East, as well as in Catholicism, you know, your relationship with God or the divine tends to be mediated through others or through, uh, you know, the priest in Catholicism or, you know, uh, in collectivist cultures, um, just like we've been talking about, it tends to be um, far more in community. Um, and so people tend, tend to be uh, given <laughs> that uh, designation rather than putting it on themselves. Um, and so I think that's like one really interesting thing. Um, in particular, to answer your question more directly, I think that because of this, people tend to uh, try on, just like you said, many, you know, they're a Christian today, a Buddhist tomorrow, they, they, they do Zen in their garden and, you know, use Apple iPhones. Um, but I think this re directly relates to this pattern, which is that people tend to adopt something as their identity um, here. And so that becomes a primary force in their life. You know, Americans tend to say, I'm deeply out of line with my purpose, or I haven't found my purpose, or I'm very in agreement with my identity right now or not. And so this notion that over 50% of Americans now identify as spiritual, but not religious. I think it, I, it has to do with that identity process and this Protestant ethic with which this whole country was built upon. But I also think it has to do with the internet and that people are now being exposed to more ways of thinking, more paths up the same mountain, um, as, as you might say, um, than they ever have been before. And this is, I think, giving people the ability to, to question this, but also I think to invent their own new worldviews. And so this is actually something we currently have a very large 10 year research project going on um, at Esalen. Um, what is this worldview that we call the spiritual but not religious? And um, what, rep what does it represent? Um, what is the you know, empirical basis? What is the experiential basis? Um, what's the ontology of the various components of it? Um, because I don't think people have a very resolute answer to your question, um, but it is a thing out there. It is a worldview and people are adopting it just the same. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, that's, uh, that's a, a simple answer to your question. Thank you very much. I'd like to take it back to Reverend Matsuyama, this idea of spiritual, but not religious, you know, your profession is religion. Do you think it's possible, really possible to be spiritual without religion? And more specifically, as uh, taking up the example that Dr. Mikata brought up, do you think somebody who doesn't believe in karma and, for example, doesn't believe in reincarnation can actually be a Buddhist? <laughs> so, of course, uh, by uh, the Eastern 
definition, so they're not the Buddhist, but um, I think that the culture is very different. So in US, so they should be, they can call Buddhist. But um, I think, uh, um, so sometimes I am asked, that, is Buddhism the religion or the philosophy, especially Zen's? And uh, actually, um, I studied a six years Christian, uh, I had a six years Christian education. And uh, the, the way of the, the belief is very different from um, monotheism, inclusive of Christianity and uh, uh, the Muslims and uh, Judaism and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the Buddhism. So, so in monotheism, so they are believing uh, almighty God beyond all might. So, but uh, nobody can show the evidence of the existence of God, but they believe in the existence. But uh, it means uh, if I doing very good things, and however hard I try, we cannot be a God, right? But uh, the Buddhism, the the, the belief of Buddhism is very different. So, so of course, the Buddha has a, a great talent, but he was, uh, he, he did exist uh, 2,500 years ago in India. And so we do not believe in his existence. He did exist. So, so what we believe in that uh, he has enlightened something. So nobody can show the evidence of he has enlightened something, and there is a, a great enlightenment somewhere. But we believe in that. So so it means it is of course very very difficult. But uh, if we try very hard, there is a very small possibilities that we can be somebody like Buddha. I think this is uh, the biggest difference. So. So in that sense, so Buddhism is a very, um, can I say, more spiritual. Uh, it can be practiced by individuals. So I think uh, so this is uh, the streams of uh, the belief in United States. I think uh, the, the way of the belief it fits to that, uh, uh, the streams. So, so uh, I think this is why so Buddhism is uh, uh, the getting popular in the U.S. I believe. We've all got our various theories. I'd like to invite uh, any of the speakers if you've got questions for one another, or uh, any of you, including Dr. Mekata, Mr. Morin. You have things that you didn't have time for in your presentation, which is something to extra. You're welcome to do that. We're starting to get uh, questions in on the Q&A, which we'll turn to uh, when we need to. Um, but uh, if you'd like to say anything or add anything, go right ahead. Um, can, can I add some words? Yes, so, please do. Um, so uh, every two years, I have a chance to go to Silicon Valley and I go to uh, the bookstore in Stanford. So I always find, so the pilot's book says, it says mindfulness, mindfulness, mindfulness. But I think uh, it's, it's, it's because the students are suffering. So if they are not suffering, they do not have to read something, the books or something like that. And um, so the, the characteristics of uh, uh, the, the people in US, uh, so I, I think that, uh, so as Mikata Sensei said, so they're, how can I say, picking up the, uh, the specific teachings and the customized for their own ways. And uh, for example, so mindfulness is a good example. So mindfulness is the, one of the uh, eight fold path, uh, which uh, the Buddhist followers should follow, but uh, they're picking up only the mindfulness. But 
the balance of other eight is very important like uh, using right word or right devotion or right uh, liveliness, li livelihood. So it is something like uh, uh, if somebody says uh, the brown rice is very good for health. And uh, uh, so then what happens is that, so all oh, brown rice is very good for health and uh, eating lots of brown rice and having uh, the vitamin from the tablets and drinking uh, the protein and go to the uh, the gym the for work so, so something like that. But uh, the the true meaning of the uh, brown rice is good is that uh, of course we have to have a good sleep and uh, appropriate uh, exercise. And if we eat. Uh, if I, we eat right, white rice, then um, so it is uh, better to have the brown rice. So the balance is very important for the health. So I think this is uh, uh, something uh, I can say. This is a characteristics of uh, the, uh, the people in US. So mm -hmm. I think uh, so, uh, um, from the uh, Japanese uh, way, uh, from Japanese viewpoint. So I think it's a, the, so they need more balance through uh, the many uh, the visions. So, so, uh, so this is my, I'm gonna say, uh, 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 what I see mm -hmm. when I go to U United States. That's interesting. We've been talking about this kind of buffet style or a la carte mm. approach to uh, Buddhism, which is not unique to, you know, Americans studying Buddhism. I think we see it in a lot of places. And you've refined that. I, if I could paraphrase it, it's something like not really, you know, focusing on the cognitive aspects of uh, Zen practice and not the ethical part that tells us how to not just how to think, but also and not to think, but how to behave and how not to behave. And that's a big mm. part of it. Um, my personal impression of Japanese uh, Zen Buddhism is that it's very strict and it's very tough. And the image that it has in Japan is very different from the image I formed that it was kind of a free for all and you could kind of do what you want. And it's really the opposite of doing what you want. I recently read this book. I don't know if you know about it. Kaoru Nonomura it was written originally in Japanese and then in English. It's called Eat, Sleep, Sit. It uh, describes, uh, putatively describes uh, a year that somebody spent as a trainee at Eheji, mm -hmm. the Soto School Temple, and it was strict. And it reminded me of movies that I saw about people joining the Marine Corps, uh, the boot camp. And it was really brutal, quite frankly, in some ways. Uh, what, what are these people selecting for? They weren't selecting for wisdom and, and compassion. They seemed like they were, they were selecting for mental and physical toughness mm -hmm. in order to become a priest. It was very fascinating. And I think that's a pretty standard um, definition. Um, anyone else, Dr. Mevkata, Mr. Maureen, want to add points or respond? I think that um, in the context of this, this is very, this is super interesting. I wasn't sure this is where we were going to go today, but um, I think that this is not unique to Buddhism or Zen necessarily. Um, one of my favorite uh, recent books um, is a book called uh, How God Becomes Real. And it's by a Stanford, uh, Stanford researcher named Tanya Lerman. And she does this beautiful um, ontological, you know, uh, anthro really she's an anthropologist, um, looks at religions all over the world and the commonalities amongst them from the, you know, far islands of Indonesia to uh, Christian uh, in the United, Christianity in the United States and um, everything in between. And one of the things that they all have in common is there's generally a extraordinarily complex story um, and set of ethics um, or moralities at the center. Um, usually it's a book or something or a set of practices. And generally they're so complex and there are so many practices that almost no individual could do all of them. And so the thing that binds the social aspects of the 
uh, religion t together or the spirituality together is the constant negotiation amongst the participants around which of the things that they are adhering to. And you can go even more meta with that and say, well, the different sects of the each uh, spirituality arguing over whether it's Zen or Soto Zen or, you know, these different negotiations are actually what creates community. And, um, you know, you see this very much in Judaism as well. You know, how do I keep kosher versus you keeping kosher? And this constant debate amongst the, amongst the participants. And I, I've always thought that point of view is very interesting in that the complexity of the story, the grandiosity of the stories, and the ability to then personalize the religion for oneself um, is actually part of what creates it into a social structure. Um, and so... Um, anyway, that, that came up for me as we were we were just talking about this. But um, I also think that uh, to the American point, um, and why do we choose just one? <laughs> I think it's because we tend to get quite obsessed with the current thing, and then we all copy each other, um, and almost to our detriment, you know. Um, and so whether today you're, you're definitely right, it's mindfulness and every book is about mindfulness and is mindfulness the same thing as meditation and why are we only focusing on mindfulness and not the other things? Um, I think it's a very American thing to get focused on the one thing or the one, the one solution to our problem um, and then kind of drive it far, far too far. Uh, but I do think that part of what's going on right now is there's an awakening happening and I think the pandemic actually really uh drove this as well where people are realizing that it, it takes more than one thing more than the newest craze whether it's spiritual or diet or whatever um and so i think people are broadening their perspective and perhaps eastern ways of thinking are are uh affecting things a little bit more thank you very much and uh i, I appreciate your point that uh it's not just the Americans who adapted Zen or Buddhism when it got there. Uh, I think every country does that. And if you if you look at uh, this book, you know, it's Japan is famous for being a very vertical society. And uh, that sort of uh, the you know, almost ijime or bullying that went on is not something that's unique to Japanese Zen institutions. It's throughout the whole country. With that, I'd like to I pivot, if we may, to the audience's questions. Um, we're going to be wrapping up in about 15 minutes or so, and it's time to turn from them. They're being sent to me by the chat. I'd like to begin with a historical question. We might uh, hear from Dr. Mikata, our expert on the history of Buddhism. This is the last one. The question, a wonderful question. If Zen was originally from India, how has Zen Buddhism changed and evolved during its time in Japan? So kind of picking up on the point I was making that um, Japan might have shaped uh, Zen at the same time Zen was shaping Japan. Do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, so the Buddhism itself was, you know, the born in India or Nepal, around there. And then, you know, the, the meditation is the, of course, the one of the most important factors in there. But I believe like, like Zen or Chan Buddhism, um, probably uh, Matsuyama san knows more than me about this because you are the Zen priest. Um, I believe that thinking of the like, like Zen, like Zen Buddhism or Chan Buddhism, like, like has been de developed in like, China. Mm. Is that correct? Yes. Especially, um, I think it's the, uh, in original Buddhism, uh, how can I say, uh, work, uh, are forbidden for the Buddhist priest. But uh, uh, in China, so they highly cherish uh, the, the, the works uh, in the, uh, the trainings of Zens. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we highly cherish city meditation, but uh, especially in, in Japan, we highly cherish moving meditation like uh, you know you can see the patterns on the uh, rock garden so the raking garden is uh, a kind of movie meditation and cleaning and also and the uh, writing sutras and cookings so i think this is uh uh the, the how can i say uh, the 
the evolution in uh, Japanese and Buddhism, not uh, their founding the original Zen in China uh, or in um, India. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I, we have another question here. Uh, what would you recommend to someone who is starting out on their journey of studying and learning Zen? So advice for beginners or people just approaching Zen. Hmm. Anybody want to take that? Yeah, well, so I have one idea. Yes. So uh, in tea ceremony world, so there is a phrase, cha zen ichi mi, tea and zen is one and the same. So in kendo, so there's a phrase, ken zen ichi no, zen and ken is one and the same. So uh, martial arts or uh, the Japanese culture, which has uh, the word of do, so I think uh, the, so they're all influenced by uh, Zen, especially spiritually. So if you are interested in uh, Zen, I highly recommend it to practice some martial arts or uh, Japanese uh, the culture with those. Interesting. Yeah. I knew you wouldn't say, go read a book. I, I knew it was going to be <laughs> <No>. hands on. <laughs> Uh, Dave, do you have any ideas on, on uh, the things that you might offer at ASLN or yourself, uh, things that you did yeah. to approach Zen? I would agree. Uh, my introduction to Zen came through the practice of Aikido, um, mm -hmm. which I, as a young, as a young youngster, um, I grew up in Montana, which normally you wouldn't uh, associate with uh, martial arts or Zen, I suppose, more associated with cowboys. Uh, but, uh, I was lucky to have a, uh, an Aikido dojo, uh, and, a um, sensei who studied in Japan and was a 12th degree black belt. And so I was able to learn quite a lot, uh, both about, uh, Aikido, but meditation, um, and Zen early on. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, we offer, uh, as you know, we just reopened about halfway through the year um, at Esalen and, uh, but throughout the year we offer uh, various different workshops. Um, our, our primary workshop um, type is meditation of various different kinds. And uh, we do do Zen, um, although uh, we're just finishing the schedule for all of next year. So, but you can expect to see some things there. Um, the only other thing I would say is, uh, I think uh, go to Japan when the border opens again. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think experiencing um, whether it's the gardens or the ritual uh, or the rituals or having an opportunity to sit with a um, uh, someone who can teach you uh, is really the, the best way. Um, you know, you have to experience. I think the, the American way of you can also get an Alan Watts book, I suppose, um, but I think it's quite hard to learn Zen by reading a book. I could give you a lot of lists of books not to read. Uh, yeah. That's sure I could give you books to read. Um, we have another one here. This is tailor made. I know it's it's right in uh, Dr. Mikata's alley. Could you talk about Zen versus Tibetan Buddhism? Yeah. Buddhism is a huge, huge religion. It's like, it's, you know, it's like we're talking about Christianity. We, we just throw the word Buddhism around. It's so old and it's so diverse that I think we, um, you know, think all Buddhism is Zen or something like that. So could you tell us a little bit about what Tibetan Buddhism is like compared to Zen, please? Um, so Tibetan Buddhism, the most the important factor is, I think, the esoteric Buddhism. That's really important in there. And then, um, of course, they do a lot of meditation. That's kind of a part of Zen, I believe. But um, the most, like, the, after like they study like fundamental things, um, they start like they start to learn esoteric Buddhism. And then, like in India, like um, basically, that has gone around like. 11th or 12th century or so, but um, that um, went to the Tibet and then still um, lives in there. And then so Tibet is um, the 
I could say like the almost the only one like Buddhism who which like still like maintain the the kind of like the latest Indian Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, we have another one here. This is interesting. How do you imagine Zen will be practiced 10 to 20 years from now in this age of internet and remote interactions? I've already seen online um, remote Zazenkai where people mm -hmm. can meditate with people all over the world. Reverend Matsuyama, I saw your videos. Mm -hmm. I did a couple of them. They're wonderful. Mm -hmm. Sit and, and just sit with you in your beautiful garden, but also live meditation where you're actually with, I haven't done those, but you're with people who are meditating mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, Dave said a lot about we, you know, we're individual. Americans are famous for bowling alone. I think there are a lot of people meditating alone who mm -hmm. might be su surprised to learn that, you know, you meditate together, you, you mm -hmm. sit down together, you eat together, you live together. Somebody lights the incense and you sit there for 45 minutes together mm -hmm. and it kind of keeps you honest. And of course, we all know about the big stick that somebody hits you mm -hmm. with and uh, the, that liberates you and saves you. So ideas about uh, what's going to happen 10 to 20 years from now. Are we going to, you know, is, is uh, online meditation here to stay, for example? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, my master always say that uh, the the direction is very important. Of course, for just for beginners, so online meditation is good to interested in um, Zen or the meditation. But uh, it is something like a car. So if you drive a Melusitis or a Porsche, Ferrari. So the body is wonderful and the interior is uh, very nice and a good engine. But if you're, if you run with the direction, it is just a tool for the violence. So it is the same with uh, the trainings. So the, to what direction you train is very important. So the guidance is uh, the keys. So uh so sometimes so if you practice meditation just for yourself it comes to not good directions so uh, uh if they want to have the the right devotion and the right ways of the meditation uh the guidance is uh of course uh, it is uh, essential mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah. we're getting... Go ahead, please. And I would, as someone who's worked in uh, digital and the internet for much yes. of my career, um, I think this is a very important question. And it's a question actually that we are spending a lot of time thinking about at Esalen, um, given our proximity to Silicon Valley. And one of the things that we've heard a lot, and um, uh, Daiko taught me a lot of this, actually over the pandemic. Uh, we had a conversation about halfway through the pandemic um, where he was you know, saying to me that he was surprised that the uh, Sangha was willing to engage digitally um, and that one of the key components of it was to create a shared experience that transcended the digital aspect. And um, I think uh, Daiko, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but you sent out mm -hmm. uh, 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 some artifacts for the ritual to folks um, while you would do, you would lead the meditation on Zoom, but people would have a, uh, an incense or a, um, yeah. a, a, a bowl of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is actually a critical thing to think about when we're thinking about the future, especially 20, 30 years out. You know, mm -hmm. we may have something much better than the Zoom we're using today. Um, maybe we're using who knows uh, what to connect, but to create a multi-sensory shared experience um, is something that I think is the critical question. And Esalen, you know, we have a deeply um, uh, 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 sensory, very powerful sensory experience, which includes nature. Um, we have one of the only large scale onsens in the United States. Um, so people are embodied in a way um, 
when they are at Esalen that um, you don't experience when you're just sitting at home or sitting on Zoom. And, uh, you know, all five of your senses are engaged in ways that they otherwise would not be. And so that's the question that I think about um, when thinking about this. And at Esalen, we've been calling this deep digital. How do you uh, create a deep transformative experience or a deep meditation experience, and in particular, a shared version of that in a group um, where people have some artifacts or some something that actually creates a similar somatic embodied experience for them um, over distance rather than in addition to the the right direction. And I think that's that's the question that I that I, I'm spending a lot of time and we're spending a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, I've been hearing a lot about the metaverse and uh, virtual reality and uh, it's really a brave new world. We are yeah. pro- thank you. We are approaching the end of our time together. I'd like to invite if any of you have uh, final thoughts, things that you didn't get to say, would like to add, you're welcome to. So can I start? Yes, please. Yeah. So thank you very much for wonderful conversation uh, for all participants, uh, Mekato-sensei, Dave, and uh, Atokin-sensei. So as uh, Dave said that uh, um, when the border is open, I w- would like to welcome the audience to uh, the Myoshinji because uh, so, uh, of course, it, it, it is digital world, but uh, the atmosphere is very important. Uh, for example, um, uh, it, it was before pandemic, but uh, uh, we have the exchange program with uh, the Muslim teachers in uh, Asian countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and some part of the Philippines. And one of the leaders uh, of Muslim uh, schools said that uh, we went to the mountains of here in Kyoto, and they say that, uh, so it is not, uh, how can I say? Um, uh, so they can they can understand that, that there are multiple gods in this atmosphere. Of course, uh, there are uh, so the, the, uh, Muslims, so single god, but uh, they could feel s- multiple gods uh, in Kyoto. So I think this is the power of the atmosphere. So if you have a chance to come to Japan, I would like to welcome you to the temple. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, it was really interesting. Everything was pretty interesting. And then um, recently I read um, part of Zui Monkey, um, the introduces um, the, the Zen master Dogen's world. And then um, the company, and then today's conversation reminds me that, um, so I believe, um, so the one passage that the Master Dogen said, um, like people who like started believing like Buddhism, they often want to like know what is the essence of the Buddhism or Dharma or things like that. But do not think like that, just go to the temple and then the practice learn under the good teachers and just do whatever teachers say. Mm-hmm. And then eventually you might know something. Mm-hmm. And then I think that's it. It's, it's pretty, a bit typical thinking. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, that's, yeah. So I remind that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, my deepest gratitude for having me today. Um, and I, I suppose to riff on my last comments, um, it's a brave new world. Uh, we all now live in two worlds. Uh, we live in this Zoom metaverse, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then we live in the real offline world. And um, I think that uh, my colleagues here have said it best that um, Zen comes best through practice and um, without experience. And I think without experience offline, um, you know, uh, uh, progress is difficult. And so um, I, would, I would encourage everyone to get offline and um, find, find their way to practice uh, as much as possible because this, this gravity is very strong right now. And uh, I think it, the future depends on it. 
Thank you very much. I think we all realize what a, actually what a great blessing it is to have technologies like this that allow us to maintain our connections together in, a, for example, a program like now. And, uh, you know, we're speaking from the East Coast, the West Coast of the United States, from Kyoto, and it's really doing powerful things. But at the Pretty same amazing. time, yes, it's a fabulous. It's a great blessing amidst a curse. Uh, but we all, uh, all, I think we all appreciate how great we had it when we were able to have direct experiences offline as well. I'd like to give myself, uh, well, I'd first like to apologize to everybody whose question we couldn't get to. There are wonderful questions in here, and I wish we could get to them all. They're really great. Um, I would uh, like to uh, put in my own little piece and a little thing I didn't get to, and that's the concept of kodawari, a certain meticulousness or fussiness, or even just caring about the way things are done and the precision in the way things are done, that I think is characteristic of uh, Japanese, modern Japanese culture and not exclusively, you can see it in other, other countries, other cultures as well. But I think it's tightly associated with Zen, the focus that Dogen puts on, you know, things to do when you're eating, even using the toilet, it's all registered, it's all prescribed. Um, it's very, uh, in a certain sense, Japanese, but it's also perhaps a two-way um, uh, uh, relationship between Zen and Japan. And that's one of the things I think that what I heard Steve Jobs took away from Zen, um, the design on the inside of the computer where nobody's going to look at it. He got from Japanese craftsmen who, when they were cutting the holes in the shoji, they said, this is the most careful part. Nobody's ever going to see it, but I know what's there. That's Kodawadi. And it's something that you see in, uh, in Zen. It's something you see in all kinds of Japanese culture, you know, the focus on, on time, for example. That's a great segue for me. Speaking of time, I think I'm going to close it up right now. I would like to be prompt. This is uh, Japan Society after all. We've gone over a little bit. Uh, we'll call that sabisu, a little bit of extra for everybody. We didn't want to end at eight o'clock on the dot, but I think it's time to wrap it up. I'd like to thank again, our wonderful, wonderful speakers, uh, Reverend Matsuyama, Dr. Mekata, Mr. Maureen, for your fabulous comments and your time and your presence here. I'd like to thank all of our wonderful audience members who are joining us all over the world and for your fabulous questions. If you do have a moment, I know there are so many surveys going on, but if you could fill out a short survey about this program, it would be wonderful for the organizers uh, to try and figure out how to uh, have more programs. You can find the link, it's in the chat, and we really appreciate your precious time and your opinion about the feedback. And the last thing I'd like to say is the next one in the Living Tradition series is a live webinar on Thursday, November 11th, and that's 7 p.m. I'm not quite sure. I think that's uh, New York time. Um, Eichi Shibusawa, the new figure on the 10,000 yen note. Um, we're really going from the sacred to the profane here. Uh, Eichi Shibusawa, the spirit of Japanese ethical capitalism and sustainability. So there is actually spirit in there as well. And we very much hope you can join us at that event as well. We invite you to come. Thank you all very, uh, uh, very much for attending. I wish you all a good day or a good night, good evening, and be well. <laughs>